Well, uh, welcome everyone to the latest Islands Matter uh, webinar and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to, to, to you today Dr John Goodlad, um, who is going to talk about his uh, most recent research which will be coming out in a, a, a book that we're all looking forward to, The Salt Roads. Um, John uh, has worked in the seafood industry uh, all his life and uh, is advising several large seafood organisations and companies at the moment. Uh, but John, within Shetland, is also very well known as being a, a passionate Shetlander. And in, um, in his younger years, uh, was a, a Shetland political activist. Um, and uh, we love to talk about that, um, a, but maybe not today. Um, and a, John has undertaken a, a fascinating piece of PhD research, which it culminated in uh, a, a really popular book, uh, The Cod Hunters, which I would uh, absolutely recommend to people who want to know more about the, the history of, of Shetland's uh, cod fishing uh, industry. I've, I've bought several copies myself and sent to uh, family members. Um, so uh, John is, is well known uh, to the UHI, has had a, a long relationship, particularly with the North Atlantic Fisheries College and um, I'm sure you'll be happy to uh, answer your questions um, about uh, Shetland's fishing heritage um, or maybe even his earlier political activism. Uh, so if you want to put some questions in uh, the chat, we'll follow those and uh, we'll uh, um, direct them to him uh, later on. But without um, blithering on any further, I'd like to uh, say hello, John, please take over. Thank you, Andrew, for that uh, kind introduction, and uh, I'm delighted to speak to so many of you here today. As Andrew said, um, my uh, talk today is called, it's the title of my new book, which uh, will be published in September. It's called The Salt Roads of Fish Created Culture. The salt roads were, of course, the ocean voyages which Shetlanders travelled to catch fish. And they were also the routes used to export that fish from Shetland once it had been dried and salted. Uh, it placed Shetland at the hub of a salt fish trade that spanned the whole of Europe, right from the Arctic, right down to Spain in the south and Russia in the far east. And this salt fish trade inspired many artists over many years and so helped create our Shetland culture and the culture of, of similar island communities. And that's a theme that runs through my book. It's not just simply a book about the great Shetland fisheries and the great Shetland salt fish trade. It's also a book about how the fishing industry and its trade has inspired all kinds of artists. So what I want to do today is to run through the main themes of my book and the, 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 the three main fisheries that are covered in my book. And I'll also include a few readings from my book. But before we start, I think it's really important to recall how important salt fish used to be. In our days of freezing, canning, and just in su time supply chains, we forget that even 50 years ago, salting of protein uh, was the only way to keep food especially in poorer communities where there was perhaps a surplus of protein uh, when animals were killed or fish were harvested in the summer. And you had to find some way of keeping this through until the winter time. So salt fish became an incredibly important part of the European insurance policy against malnutrition and sometimes even starvation. So talking about salt fish, it kind of took when we go around Tesco's and Sainsbury's and Co-op and fill up with all our fresh produce, I think we really forget how incredibly important salt fish was to the whole of Europe in the past. In much of Northern Europe, economies, societies and cultures were built around salt fish. And uh, nobody probably articulates that importance more than the famous Icelandic novelist, Halder Laxness. And Halder Laxness wrote in 1932 a book called Salka Valder. 
And it's a story about a precocious young woman called Salvar Valgadar from the fictional village of Osiri. It deals with the very contemporary issues of gender and feminism, subjects that were rarely addressed then. But it's also about salt fish. The salt fish trade is the reason why Osiri exists in the first place. And it's how everyone makes a living. It's why Salvar Valgadar travels to Osiri so that she can get work and make a living. So Laxness was not being in the least bit ironic when he wrote in this novel, when all is said and done, life is first and foremost about salt fish. Shetland's adventure with salt fish spans 300 years, perhaps more, and it covers three very important uh, and very distinctive fisheries. First of all, the half fishery, uh, the fishery where a variety of species, but mainly ling, were caught around Shetland by small boats and were salted and dried and exported to mainly the UK and Ireland. And then, as Andrew has spoken about, the cod fishery, which was a completely different kind of fishery in the 19th century. It was a large distant water fishery, which is the subject of my first book, with about 90 decked schooners, sloops, smacks, and these boats fished North Iceland, Faroe, even Greenland, uh, and also around Rockall. And they fished for a long period of time, perhaps 12, 14 weeks, and took back cod, which was again salted and dried and exported mostly to Spain. And then the final fishery was the biggest one of all, and that was the herring fishery. It developed much later in the late 19th century, and herring were caught primarily around Shetland and were gutted, salted in barrels and exported to Germany, Poland, and into Russia and even into uh, Siberia. So Shetland, as I've said, was at the hub of these, this salt fish trade, which lasted for so many years. So I'll go through each of these fisheries in turn and say a little bit about each. The half fishery was prosecuted by six areas. These were open boats. Um, those of you who live in Shetland or know Shetland may have seen the Vela May, which is a replica six areen, which lies on the beach below the Shetland Museum. Uh, these boats were powered by six oars, sometimes a small sail. It was almost a standard design through Scandinavia. And you only have to look at this boat to see its origins in a Viking longship. Uh, and they were used in Iceland, Norway, Faroe, Shetland. Uh, these uh, boats went out with long lines. Uh, they set these in the seabed. Uh, they were out for about a couple of days. Open boats, uh, no more than 30 feet in length, uh, no shelter whatsoever, perhaps fishing as far as 20 or 30 miles from the land. And even though it was a summer fishery, it was very, very dangerous. The Icelandic author, Kalman Stephenson, chillingly described sixerines, and he was talking, of course, about the Icelandic sixerines, but this applies equally well to Shetland sixerines. He described these boats as cockle shells the size of coffins. At its peak, the half fishery was undertaken by about 500 sixerines, employing 3,000 men. All around Shetland, every community had its fleet of sixerines. But you can only understand the half fishery if you move away from the sea and look at the land. You can only understand what powered the half fishery if you look at land tenure. At this time in Scotland, uh, the lairds were clearing crofters from the glens to make way for sheep. The best way to make money was from sheep, not from people paying rents. In Shetland, the lairds found they could make even more money from exporting salt fish. So what they wanted to do was to increase the population. So the crofts were subdivided. New crofts were created on the sides of bleak hillsides. And driving around Shetland today, just look either to your right or left, and you'll see these ruins of tiny houses and a few fields. You can hardly believe that people brought up families there. And of course, the croft couldn't provide a living. But what it did provide was large families and crews uh, of men for the six areas. It was an iniquitous system. It was called the truck system. It was essentially a form of debt bondage. If you refused to fish for the laird and you didn't sell your fish to the laird, you were then thrown off your croft. 
Uh, it frankly was a little different from serfdom. It was also a very, very dangerous occupation. Uh, many six rings were lost in many storms. The most well known is 1881, uh, when a number of six rings were lost uh, during a two day storm. Uh, a wonderful memorial has been erected at Gloop in the north of Yell, marking that disaster. Perhaps what less well known was the disaster in 1832. This was literally a once in a hundred year storm. In the middle of July, a fierce storm with gale and severe gale and storm force winds from the northwest lashed Shetland for more than five days. Remarkably, only 17 boats and 105 men were lost. It was obviously a devastating blow, but given the severity of the storm, it was remarkable. It was not more. So I now want to read uh, an excerpt from my book dealing with the 1832 storm. And this is in a chapter of the book called Philadelphia. One of the six rings that had been thought lost with all hands was from the island of Walsall. Today, this island is home to one of the most modern fishing fleets in Europe. But in the early 19th century, it was just one of many poor Shetland communities trying to eke a living from the sea. Tammy Hewson and his crew, including his two sons, Willie and Lowry, were tired by the time they had rowed to the fishing grounds and shot their lines. Remarking about the abnormal calm that surrounded them, the skipper was also concerned about how warm it was. He felt uneasy. It was never, uh, it was never this warm and calm when you were 30 miles east of Shetland in an open boat. With the sudden onset of the storm at midnight, the crew immediately knew what had to be done. Four men hauled on the, row, on the oars to keep their head to wind, while the other two furiously bailed. It was hard work, with no time to rest or eat. Within minutes, every man was soaked through. Hour by hour, this continued. As Tuesday morning became Tuesday evening, a combination of sheer terror and the determination to hang on to life fueled a superhuman effort to keep their boat afloat. But eventually the fuel runs out. By Wednesday morning, serious exhaustion had set in and the crew had reached the point of giving up and allowing the six ring to run before the storm in the certain knowledge that she would broach, fill with water and sink. It was at that point that they saw the loud sailing bark in the distance. This was the Edwards, a Danish ship on her way to America with emigrants on board. Summoning their last reserves of energy, Hewson's crew rowed towards the bark. The captain of the Edwards had seen them and was able to steer his ship into the wind, allowing the Walsall boat to come close behind on a lee quarter. A rope was set. Uh, made fast to hold her in position while a Jacob's ladder was thrown over the side. The seas were so mountainous that one minute the six ring was level with the deck of the Edwards, and the next minute she was level uh, with the keel. It was impossible to get hold of, let alone climb up the Jacob's ladder. Ropes were then lowered to haul the crew on board, one by one. For some reason, one of the crew, Davy Henderson, failed to properly secure the rope to himself. Whether he thought he still had the strength to hold on or, as was more likely, his mind had become adult through exposure and fatigue, he lost his grip and fell to his death in the raging seas. Once on board, the rest of the crew were carried below decks where they were revived by dry clothes, food and brandy. Tammy Hewson asked if there was any chance they could be put ashore in Lerwick. The captain explained it would take him several days tacking into the storm to reach Lerwick and he was therefore going to maintain his course to pass between Orkney and Shetland on his way to Philadelphia. By the time they arrived in America, the Shetlanders had fully recovered and were anxious to get back home as soon as they could. But that was not going to be easy. They had no money and their only possessions were the clothes they were wearing. A Quaker church managed to find some accommodation and work for them while they waited to see if the British consul could get them home. Eventually, securing a passage on a ship bound for Liverpool. They arrived in late September, in late December, sorry. Making their way to Leith, they boarded the George Canning, which was scheduled to arrive in Lerwick on Christmas morning. 
when they arrived, there was incredulity that this crew thought lost in the July gale had survived. Anxious to return to their families, they tried to arrange a lift to Falsa with a Lerwick six room. This was not easy as it was Christmas morning and permission had to be sought from the church before they could leave. That same morning in Walsa, the skipper's old dog, which had pined for her master over the past six months, had become restless and agitated when let out of the barn by the skipper's widow, Charlotte Kay. She had lost her husband and two sons in the gale and was struggling to make a living from the small croft for her seven remaining children. The dog set off running to the south, away from the Houston croft. Charlotte sent two of the younger boys to fetch her back, thinking she had more than enough to cope with on that bleak Christmas morning without an unruly dog. After a long chase over the rough ground, the two Houston brothers eventually caught up with their dog. She was running back and forth on a beach, barking at a sixering that was slowly approaching. A small crowd had gathered, having already seen the boat in the distance. No one could think of any good reason why a sixering would be sailing to Falsa on Christmas morning. And then the impossible happened. The entire island had spent six months grieving for the crew, and now here they were stepping ashore. Disbelief and shock must have been only two of the emotions experienced by everyone on the beach. These were men who they had believed had drowned last July. As word went around the island and as each man was united with his family, there was unbridled joy that was only tempered when Davy Henderson's widow Merton Shearer arrived to ask how her husband had met his end. A few weeks after they had arrived back home, Charlotte received a letter with the Philadelphia postman. It was from Tammy explaining they were alive and could try to make their way home as soon as they could. The half fishery continued right through until the early 20th century. The 1881 storm, this storm in 1832, didn't really arrest the fishery, but the 1881 did, uh, and eventually the half fishery died out in the early 20th century. But meanwhile, in the 19th century, a huge distant water fishery of a completely different scale developed, and this was the cod fishery, which I referred to. And this was the last large fleet of smacks owned by merchants that fished Greenland, Iceland, Faroe, and Rockall. They fished for about 12 or 14 weeks, so splitting and salting the cod on board. These smacks had crews of 14, sometimes 16 uh, fishers on board. And um, when researching this incredibly, uh, incredible period of Shetland's fishing history, I was struck by how these cod fishers, with no more than a compass and a sextant, knew exactly where each of the North Atlantic islands were in relation to each other. And they sometimes made incredible voyages. Fishing at Faroe, there were no fish. They went south to try Rockall, perhaps no fish. They went up to Iceland, fished, and then came back, taking two or three months to complete a voyage. And I began to reflect that these uh, fishers from the 19th century, who were very poor, but very able navigators, had a far better appreciation of distance and place than many people do today. I'm sure some of you will have experienced, if you were Shetlanders at least, the annoyance, and in my case, the verging on fury when you see Shetland placed in a box in the Murray Fair, or even worse, east of Orkney, but no disrespect to Orkney. You find this on BBC weather maps, you find it in the national press, even in some of the literature produced by the body established to cherish Scotland's landscape and culture, the National Trust for Scotland makes this mistake. Now, this is more than a geographical obsession of minds. In the same way as words are important, so are maps. Maps are one way of people relating to their home and articulating their sense of belonging. And in the theme of this webinar series, islands do matter. Faroe is nearer Shetland than Edinburgh is. Iceland is nearer to Shetland than London is. And yet, from a look at most maps of Shetland, we are 
in the wrong position, often at the wrong scale, almost tipping over the edge of the United Kingdom. This practice, this attitude, does absolutely nothing to foster a confident community, comfortable with its pivotal position in the North Atlantic. Instead, in my view, it accentuates its sense of dependence on the UK and a belief we can only look south for opportunity and support. Despite all the privations of the time, this was not something that afflicted Shetlanders in the 19th century. The Scottish government, to its credit, recently made a commitment to show Shetland in its correct geographical position in all its publications and communications. No one even expects the UK government to understand how important all of this is, let alone to follow suit. In contrast, the vision of the University of the Highlands and Islands in bringing research and learning to local communities and so making the periphery the centre is the most wonderful antidote to the geographical vandalism of our times. Moving on to the third of the uh, fisheries, uh, and this is the herring fishery. For many Shetlanders, this is the one that's still, uh, still in living memory. Uh, many Shetlanders will have fathers uh, uh, who were herring fishermen, uh, who were drift net fishermen, and mothers who went to the gutting or certainly grandfathers and grandmothers who did that. So it's still within reach. Um, and it was the biggest of them all. Uh, this was a different fishery. It was no longer fishing with lines, as the half fishery and the cod fishery did, and no longer fishing for demersal species like ling and cod. This was a net fishery. Drift nets were set uh, to catch herring. It began in 1879 when three second hand Herring boats were bought from Scotland to Shetland. These boats did incredibly well, and by 1905, there were 400 boats, all of a size comparable to the Swan. Uh, if And those of you who are from Shetland will know the Swan. It's Shetland's own tall ship. It's, uh, it was a herring boat built in Shetland 125 years ago that's been fully restored to its former sail uh, glory. Uh, if you don't know her, have a look at the Swan Trust website, and that will give you a feeling for the size of these boats. By 1905, there were 400 of these boats based in Shetland. Every community in Shetland had a few herring boats, and the herring were caught uh, every night by these boats and were taken ashore, and they were then gutted, salted, and packed in barrels by on curing yards. Uh, and were then exported, as I've said, to largely Eastern Europe, to Germany, to Poland, and to Russia. The herring fishery is known for its boats, the numbers of barrels of herring exported. For many years, there were more than 2 million barrels of salt herring exported from Shetland every year, and Lerwick was sometimes referred to as the herring capital of Europe. Uh, so there's all kinds of mesmerizing statistics, but there, this fishery was important, I think, historically and socially for two perspectives. First of all, the cod fishery and the half fishery had kept Shetland very much remote from Scotland, especially the cod fishery. We were very much in the Scandinavian sphere of influence in terms of where the boats fished, in terms of where the fishermen went. The herring fishery brought Shetland very much into the Scottish sphere of economic influence. The Shetland herring fishermen were joined by fishermen from Scotland and England, and the herring fishery, of course, took place all around the UK. So it's important, first of all, in, in bringing Scotland, bringing Shetland very much into the Scottish orbit. But it's also, I think, incredibly important uh, socially, in terms of social change in Shetland, for two reasons. First of all, the herring fishermen earned a lot of money. It really was boom times. And within 10 to 20 years, they were beginning to aspire to own their own boats. And within 30 years, the entire Shetland herring fleet was owned by the fishermen, thereby laying the foundations for the modern fleet of fisher-owned boats we have today. It was such a contrast to the half, where the lairds controlled everything and the fishermen were simply serfs. And it was a contrast to the 
cod fishery where the boats were owned by merchant companies and the fishermen were simply employed. Hugely important, fishermen became no longer wage earners, they became entrepreneurs in their own right. And secondly, and equally importantly, for the first time ever in Shetland history, here was an opportunity for paid employment for women. Prior to this, there was really no paid employment for women in Shetland. It was a case of working on the family croft uh, uh, and, uh, or leaving Shetland to find employment, perhaps in service in a big house uh, as a servant. But here there were opportunities for, in the 117 curing yards all around Shetland for thousands of women, uh, mostly young women. And not only did they get for the first time ever in their life some financial independence, they earned their own money, but they also got an early taste of freedom. They escaped the claustrophobia of the Croft and the immediate family. They mixed with other young women. Uh, and, and I think the social impact of both of these things in terms of the earning capacity of fishermen and the change in, in, in the status and structure of, of women uh, have yet to be fully researched, made an enormous uh, impact, I believe, on the social history of Shetland at the time. The industry continued to develop. Uh, in the fullness of time, uh, steam replaced sail, and then diesel engines replaced steam. But the fishing technique of drift netting remained until the 1970s. Of course, now it's, uh, it's, it's deep sea trawling, but right up until the 1970s, herring was still caught in the same way uh, as it was caught when the herring fishery started in the late 19th century. Many people believe that the halcyon days of the herring fishery was the age of steam and steel, when large steel herring drifters powered by steam engines fished around the British coast. And I want to do now a small reading from my book uh, on this subject, and it's called Drifters. The evening crowds were bustling outside the Tivoli Picture Theatre on the Strand as George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells and other socialists from the London Film Society made their way inside the impressive new cinema. Completed in 1923, it was built from white Portland stone and was a fitting venue for London's intelligentsia, who came there every week to view and discuss avant-garde films. It was November 1929 and the film club were in for a treat. Not only were they to watch the much lauded film Battleship Potemkin, but the highly acclaimed Soviet director, Sergei Einstein, would be there himself to answer questions. Sometimes described as the greatest film ever made, this silent black and white masterpiece was based on the actual events of 1905, when sailors on board the Battleship Potemkin mutiny. An act of political defiance within the Imperial Russian Navy, this became an important symbol of the 1905 revolution that is often described as the dress rehearsal for 1917. It was not only the revolutionary significance of this movie that had attracted London's intellectuals, but the film itself was already being hailed as an incredible artistic achievement with its groundbreaking use of montage. But all of this was lost on the British establishment. Britain was still reeling from the impact of the 1926 Chamber strike, and many regarded this film as nothing less than a piece of communist propaganda. Such was the fear that this powerful film might foment further political and industrial unrest in Britain that following this private screening at the London Film Club, it was banned from public view until 1954. It used to be the case in cinemas that there was a double bill with the main feature being prefaced by a shorter film. Accompanying Battleship Potemkin that evening was a brand new 40 minute film called Drifters. Directed by an unknown Scotsman called John Grierson, this was described as a factual film about the herring fishing. Drifters was a rather surprising choice to sit alongside Einstein's, to sit alongside Einstein's triumph, as it had none of the drama and allure of revolution and was on the face of it, a potential dull film. This short film, however, captivated the audience that evening. The following morning, the press reviews 
enthusiastically described this work as novel, unconventional and depressing. It was, as one critic wrote, the most original piece of cinema art. This so-called factual film was the first example of a brand new type of cinema, the documentary. And if any of you, it, it really is a wonderful piece of film and, and I, I, I guess I, it's my subject and I'm a bit obsessive about it, but I watch it from time to time. You can get it on YouTube, The Drifters, and it really is an incredible piece of documentary. Much of it is actually filmed in Shetland on board Shetland boats, uh, although you, you wouldn't know it at the time. Um, you'll see, those of you that know a little bit about Shetland fishing in the sea will recognise one or two of the boats. So I would certainly recommend you to, uh, to have a look at that. Another theme that I look at in my book, as well as the interplay between these three important salt fisheries and the salt fish trade and art and how this has inspired artists, filmmakers, novelists, musicians, poets. Another theme that I that, that's intertwined through my book is the whole question of sustainability. And even though my book is hist historical, I do bring it up to date and looking at the whole question of sustainability. Everyone now knows about our global car carbon footprint uh, and perhaps not so many people realise that 25% of our global carbon footprint is from the food we eat, how much greenhouse gases are released to produce our food. A really interesting piece of research was undertaken at the Fisheries College, now uh, the Scalway campus of Shetland, UHI, a few years back. Uh, by uh, Francis Sanderson, looking at the carbon footprint of various types of protein. And some types of protein production are incredibly inefficient. It takes about 30 kilograms of beef of greenhouse gases are released to produce one kilogram of beef, 30 to one. Pork is a bit better. Pork and lamb range from six to 12 or 15, depending on whether it's fed naturally or fed in feedlots. Chicken is the best of all, uh, three to six uh, kilograms of greenhouse gas released for uh, one kilogram of chicken. Fish, however, whether caught or farmed, is always less than three. Mackerel caught by the large pelagic claws is 0 0.5. And the best of all is farmed mussels at 0 0.2. Seafood is often portrayed as a huge problem, the production of seafood, and I'm sure many of you have seen the Sea Spiracy documentary. But I would argue, and I think this piece of this piece of research demonstrates that far from being part that far from being a problem, seafood is actually part of the solution for global food security with a low carbon footprint. We all have a personal responsibility to reduce our carbon footprint, to be careful in the food choices we make. And at all costs, and at all costs, avoid waste. It's an incredible to realise the amount of food that's wasted every year, whether left on plates at the end of a meal, whether uh, thrown out of restaurants at the end of the week, or whether dumped by supermarkets. It really is a scandal. So my final reading, uh, and I'll conclude after this, Andrew, is again from my book, and this is from a chapter in my book called Texas Eco Warriors. Many of those zealous campaigners see themselves as passionate idealists seeking to save the oceans. For those who see the ocean as a source of protein produced in a sustainable manner, the zealots' reckless actions are best misguided and at worst hypocritical. And the saddest thing of all is that they are unaware of the contradictions in what they do or say. A few years ago, I attended a meeting in London with a well-known American NGO discussing the problem of discards. Discarding is the practice where fish are thrown back into the sea because they are too small, there's no market for them, or they are more than a vessel's quota allocation. Since these discards are all dead, it is an, unco it is an unconscionable practice that, need that a solution to which needs to be found. Needs to be found. We had a good discussion during which some possible solutions, such as increased mesh sizes on nets to allow small fish to escape, were discussed. 
I became increasingly annoyed, however, by the hectoring tone of two women who hailed from Texas. Fishers were acting immorally when discarding fish, I was told. Did they not understand they were destroying the marine environment? How could they stand by and see all this fish going to waste as it was being thrown over the side? It was not an atmosphere that fostered a meeting of minds, but I struggled on being far too polite. Anyhow, in the evening, we all went out to dinner and I found myself sitting between the two eco warriors from Texas. I tried to keep the conversation relaxed and endeavored to find some common ground. It was not easy, but after a few glasses of wine and some nice fresh fish, a more convivial atmosphere developed. I enjoyed my dinner and as I had been brought up to do, ate everything on my plate. It was then that I noticed on either side of me, the waiter was taking away fish that had only been picked up. I abhor waste, and it occurred to me that here was fish that had been discarded. Not discarded because of complex quota rules or because of poorly designed trawls, but because it was either not to the taste of the eaters or because they were not hungry. Both are problems associated with privileged people who live in the developed world. Two fish had died to provide them with food, with food, yet the two Texan diners were entirely unaware of their hypocrisy. It annoys me to this, to this day that I did not call them out. Food waste, like obesity, is a problem of the developed world. It's everywhere but not visible and is frequently ignored. According to WWF, over a billion tons of food is wasted every year. This is an astonishing figure that should shame us all. The food wasted by those who have more than they need, while hundreds of millions do not have enough to eat, is a global disgrace that gets little airtime. I never, I've not subsequently met them again in order to tell them what I thought, but I hope someday I will. Uh, so, by way of conclusion, that uh, I hope will give you a little bit of a feel of my forthcoming book, The Historical Tale of Saltfish, these three iconic Shetland fisheries that spanned hundreds of years, and how this, this tale of saltfish, fishing, saltfish production and export of saltfish intertwines uh, with art, and how this saltfish uh, trade has inspired literature, music, filmmaking and art over many years. I also hope my book will demolish the idea that Shetland is remote and far away. As far as Shetland, as far as salt fish was concerned, Shetland was at the epicenter of Europe. And Shetland's historical adventure with fish is not over. And there's no question that as the debate on carbon footprint reaches, the Shetland seafood industry has an important message to convey. It truly is part of the solution, not the problem. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, John. Uh, well, that will be on my uh, reading list uh, when it comes out. Um, and again, you've shown the, the importance of, of history and how it's relevant uh, to today, which is a, a great example. And um, maybe you can call out the two Texan women in, in a footnote. You can stick their names there, and then we can find out who they, who they were. Um, there's so many uh, questions that uh, occur to me, um, and I'll ask uh, just a couple, and that'll give people uh, a chance to um, come up with with their own. Um, one thing is, uh, uh, there's the importance of, of salt. Um, well, a few questions about that. Uh, where did it come from? Um, what about sh sh um, salt fish in the Shetland diet? And is there any evidence that, that Shetlanders and other Northern Europeans are uh, salt resistant because they must have eaten an awful lot of the, this stuff? Um, uh, yeah, so salt, first of all. Uh, salt in itself is, a, is, is an, an amazing uh, story. At, at one time before the age of money, salt was used as a currency, as you probably know. Such was its importance. Uh, for the preservation of food. The salt which was used in Shetland in the half fishery and the cod fishery largely came from Spain. As the boats delivered the salt cod to Spain, they picked up Mediterranean produced salt cod. So they traveled as like the 
it, it, it's like the many trucks do today. They have a load in both directions, so it made a lot of sense. Uh, the salt for um, uh, the herring fishery, some of that came from the Baltic as the boats came back to the Baltic. Um, so, yes, fascinating. Um, salt in diet, I guess I'm the last generation of Shetlanders for whom salt fish wasn't uh, an unusual part of the diet in my own family. My dad was a fisherman. We lived in Hamnevo. Uh, we had salt herring every Saturday. Uh, and we then had salt. Usually, Shetlanders tended to eat salt, uh, uh, say, Celtics, and salt ling. Not so much salt cod. That was too valuable to eat. It was kept for exporting. We probably had that twice a week. So I was eating salt fish at least three times a week. And that was not in the slightest bit unusual, especially in Shetland's fishing communities. And throughout not only Northern Europe, I mean, there's a lot of salt fish eaten. The salt fish diet has not yet died out. Any of you who traveled to Portugal or Spain and have eaten bacalao, the basis of the wonderful bacalao cuisine in, the, in Iberia is salt cod. Uh, and uh, so, Salt cod is still used there, is still eaten there. Salt herring, funnily, in Eastern Europe, one of the main markets for salt herring were the Shettles, the very poor rural Jewish villages in Poland and in Russia, where the poor Jewish communities had very little. And a barrel of salt herring in the house was often the difference between surviving a bad Siberian winter and not. And of course, all of that died distillate herring and distillate uh, uh, frozen herring. But interestingly enough, that salt fish, that salt herring cuisine became an integral part of uh, the Jewish Sabbat. Salt herring was never traditional in, in the Holy Land, uh, but it became very much part of the Jewish dietary tradition in Europe. Uh, and to this day, uh, there's still uh, a, a handsome export of herring to, to Israel, where salt herring and varieties of salt herring are still eaten on the Friday night, on the night before their Saturday Sabbath. Uh, so the whole question of salt is, is fascinating, and I do explore some of these salt uh, topics in my book as well. Thank you very much. Um, that's, that's great. Uh, there's uh, some questions have uh, appeared in the, in the chat now, so I don't know if you can you can open that, uh, but you'll see there's there's one from from Jen here. She says, uh, as well as saying, very enjoyable talk, which of course it was. Um, uh, she wants, wonders whether um, during the time period that you're dealing with in your book, um, was there any air dried fish as well as was done in the in earlier times? Yeah, I, I uh, yes, indeed, and I should have made it clear that when I talk about so the salt ling from the half and the salt cod from the cod fishery, these fish were salted and then they were laid out on beaches. And in Shetland, when we say beach, we mean a stone beach. Uh, we don't mean a sandy beach. So they were laid out in Shetland beaches to dry. So the salt ling from the half and the salt cod from the cod fishery were uh, salted and dried. Uh, the herring, in contrast, was only salted. It wasn't dried. Um, there's very little example of air dried fish, the so called stock fish of Norway in Shetland. And I think the reason is it's too damp. Uh, to produce stock fish without salt, you need that really cold Arctic climate. So you can produce stock fish in Iceland and the north of Norway, Faroe, Shetland, the west coast of Norway. It, it, you can produce it, but it, it's not very effective. There's just too much uh, dampness in the atmosphere. Thank you. And I see uh, Frank's got his hand up. Yes, good afternoon, John. Hi, Frank. I've not seen you for oh, no. a long time. You, you have less hair than the days when we were in Aberdeen together, but you're much more eloquent these days. <laughs> I think I would rather have the hair, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a quick question, a, a bit tangential, but um, when I was doing my own book, I discovered a, a wonderful story about a village boat here which is quite surprising because it's not a natural harbour of any sort. It's just a tiny wee gull that's, that, that, that the boat lives from. And this boat was, was um, 
thought to be lost at sea, but it was it was actually hijacked and by by press ganged, and the and the village crew were sold into forced labour in the Caribbean, and we know this because the the skipper eventually managed to come home. And I wonder, is there any you know with the with the with the amount of uh, fishermen and, and boats that were in Shetland at the time, is there any recollections those days about people actually being abducted or, or, or being taken away from, from these things? It just a, maybe we could follow this up later perhaps, but just a, a, a quick uh, a quick uh, introduction to that would be interesting. Yeah, well, it's a really good question, Frank. And, and of course, the press gang, uh, which was well known throughout, uh, I suppose, north and west of Scotland and much of the UK, the Royal Navy came to communities like Shetland and the Western Isles and took away young men forcibly to serve in the Royal Navy. But there appears to be no evidence of people being taken away into slavery. And that's surprising because in Iceland and in Faroe in the 15th and 16th century, there are regular records of pirates from uh, 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 the, the Barber, pirates from uh, the Corsairs, as they were called, sailing up from the Mediterranean, landing in, in Suderoy and Faroe, uh, landing in Vestmina in, the, uh, in Iceland, the east coast of Iceland, and taking away literally hundreds of women and children and sold into slavery. And it, it's something I'm trying to research at the moment. It's not proving very easy, but, but why, when this was happening in Faroe, which is so close to Shetland, why did the Barbary pirates not just simply go a little bit east and they would have had good pickings in the west side of Shetland? So the answer to that, I don't know. It seems strange. Uh, by the way, there's a wonderful novel by Sally Magnuson called The Seal Woman's Gift about uh, the Barbary pirates raid in Vestmina in 1629 and what happened to the women and children when they were sold into slavery in North Africa. Incredible book. Thank you very much uh, for, that, for that, John. Yeah, that's something that surprised me as well. Um, maybe there was some uh, better defence uh, in Shetland at the time. Maybe they were looking out and, uh, uh, you know, from their lookout points, they could see them. I don't know, but uh, it's certainly an interesting one to to pursue. And um, other questions are coming in. Um, a, there's, well, there's a short one. There's historical evidence for salt pans in Orkney. Are there any in Shetland? Then we're going to get back to the salt question. Um, the, the honest answer to that is I don't know. Uh, if there were, they certainly weren't uh, that big because there's, no, there's huge records of the amount of salt imported into Shetland. There may have been some salt produced in Shetland, but uh, it certainly would not have been very much if there were. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then there's a, a comment from uh, from Laurie Brinklow here from Prince Edward Island. Um, your books remind me of Mark Kurlansky's books, Cod and Salt, both of which take a global view of these wide ranging topics. And it's wonderful that you've centred your stories on Shetland, which is the, the correct thing to do. Um, your rendering of the fishers as masters of the ocean, knowing the islands, the stars and the fishing banks reminds Laurie of the Pacific Islands, who are similarly knowledgeable. The sea is their road and everything is connected. But in the Pacific Islands, they seemingly have not embraced islands or maybe it's island studies in the same way. So it's more focused on the ocean. And um, she was wondering if you have any thoughts about North Atlantic fishers' attitudes towards islands. I suppose about the identity of, are the people islanders or are they more interested in the, the ocean surrounding them? Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, I have had, heard stories about people in the Pacific Islands who spent so long at sea, uh, and we're talking probably years, that when they come ashore, they feel not seasick, they feel landsick, because their body has got so used to moving around, it's the opposite. Uh, no, I, I, I think that the fishers in the North Atlantic spent a lot of time at sea. They were very good uh, at navigating, very good at, at, at being sailors, very good at fishing. Uh, and all of that, but of course, it, it was rarely done out of choice. Many of them, I'm sure, enjoyed it to some extent. It was mind-numbingly uh, repetitive, cold, hard, and dangerous work. Uh, they had to do it uh, to make a living. So I'm sure when they were doing all of this, that we 
with our 21st century perspective, kind of look back with a great sense of adventure and nostalgia. They were doing it simply to put food on the tables and to avoid being evicted in the case of the smack being evicted from the small crofts. So I think what kept them going amongst many things was the thought of their families back home and the desire to get back to their families as quickly as possible. Thank you. Uh, Laurie, by the way, she's coming to Shetland um, in June, so she'll be picking up your books when she, when she arrives. So there we go. Um, and uh, Beth's got her hand up. I do. Thanks. Thanks, John. And it's always really interesting to hear you speak about, um, about the fishing industry and its importance to, to Shetland. And it, you really get a feel for how how much it has influenced society and sh not only Shetlanders, um, sense of place and who they are but also were placing the world globally and thinking about the length of time it took that mind to get back fifth walls uh, um, uh, when we live in such a connected world now it's it's really astonishing to to hear these stories and and also uh, about again the level of skill and seamanship and connectivity around, around the world and how that's shifted you, you mentioned as well about the, the connection to the, the more Nordic countries and, and to Scotland. And I just was interested to, to hear your thoughts on that sense of place and where we sit in in, uh, in the world and that we're in a more digital culture and and how how that might um, reflect things going forward and our sense of place. Um, I was just interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, absolutely, Beth, and I think a very good question. I tried to sort of reflect on uh, post-pandemic, and with technology, we are in a different place, no question. And I think we have opportunities now uh, in an island context and in that we've got to turn upside down our old attitudes of what remote is. And because somebody uh, with good internet connection in Fula, for example, uh, or in Vatersee, for example, is not in the least bit remote. They could be talking on this kind of format with people all over the world and making as valuable a contribution to a meeting, to a discussion, to a seminar, to a webinar as anybody else. So I think technology has brought us to a different place. And I think the pandemic has accelerated that, made it clear. It's people's attitudes that have to catch up. And I think, and, and, and it's these attitudes that really annoy me where the National Trust for Scotland can't be bothered to design a map which shows Shetland in its correct position just because it's easier to cram it into an A4 size. And, and you know, I, I, you have no idea the lengthy correspondence I've had with them getting absolutely nowhere. And, and it's, it, it's the arrogant attitude of, well, you know, we've got to, it's very difficult to do. And, you know, we'll just put it in. Nobody's denied. And I said, well, look, what if you redid the map uh, and you put Edinburgh and the Lothians at a different scale and maybe in the fifth or fourth in the box. Why not do that for a year? Just well, we couldn't do that. And it's just that crazy attitude. So the metropolitan establishment attitude hasn't caught up with the technology that now opens up enormous opportunities for islands. Uh, and of course, you know, politically, we're di living in a a different uh, uh, world now, um, and all kinds of, you know, the, the, the European Union uh, is full of lots of small, prosperous, enterprising societies, countries, regions. We've been torn out of that. Uh, many of us, I don't want to get too political, but many of us would argue against our will. Um, but I really do believe that we are in, in a different uh, area now, and I think the timing for the University of the Highlands and Islands as it expands and as it develops into uh, uh, the brilliant educational institute it already is, but develops into becoming an even better one. It's just the perfect timing for UHI. Um, so, yeah, uh, a sense of place is so important and we now have the technology to demonstrate to the rest of the world what we've known all along, that Shetland is at the centre of the world. Doris, Lewis is at the centre of the world. We've known that for ages, but we've now got the technology to prove to the rest of the world that that is the case. Thank you very much. And I think 
then uh, from the centre of the world to everybody else out there. I think um, just uh, if we'd like to thank uh, John very much for a very thought provoking and interesting uh, talk. And as I say, there's numerous comments in there about when's the book going to be published and uh, the, where can we pick, it, pick a copy up. Um, so the, it's going to be published soon, isn't it? You, you said. Um, so hopefully ready for the, the book festival. And um, uh, do you have an actual date? Uh, not yet, but uh, I, uh, the Shetland Wordplay is at the end of September, and I've been assured by Biddle and the publishers it will be ready for then. Um, and uh, I'm also hopefully going to be speaking at the Orkney Science Festival, which is the first week in September, and Biddle and have also assured me it will be ready for then. But it's it's a new experience to me, I've, you know, whether they deliver or not. But I, I think it will be. It all seems to be. They've got everything they need to get it print, published now. So. Well, we're all very much looking forward to it, and uh, it'll certainly be on our, my Christmas list to members of the family. So, thanks again, John. It's always great to uh, to hear you and to have a chat. And um, with that, we'll bring this webinar to an end. Goodbye.